What's up, Accelerators? Welcome to Normalize It, the show where we speak about and explore the business of disability inclusion and accessibility. I'm your host, Cam Baudouin, and on each episode, I'll be interviewing leaders, professionals, and people with lived experiences, and we'll be discussing the challenges, successes, and strategies on how to make this world a more inclusive place. As you know, many organizations are still trying to figure out disability inclusion through a trial and error method. That's inefficient. Stick around to the end of the show to find out how we can fix that. So whether you're an advocate, entrepreneur, business owner, stakeholder, VP, or just someone who's interested in the world of disability inclusion, this show is for you. Let's dive into it. When we talked before the show, we talked a little bit about the underlying issues in accessibility, things like education, things like unemployment. What's your, what are your thoughts around that? I think a lot of the times accessibility can be seen as this issue where just how do you technically figure out how to get your website or product compliant and accessible. But I think the most important part is the other side of the coin where you have to see accessibility is really about empowering people with disabilities to be able to do things online and interact with the digital world that we live in. Since for the visually impaired community, unemployment rates are very high, upwards mm -hmm. of 60%, and education rates are also very low. A lot of these are because of big physical barriers with technology that doesn't make that process very easy. I think the biggest problems in the blind community can be solved by technology and having it be made accessible because it's like the problem is not really that I can't see, for example, it's, mm -hmm. it's that I can't do stuff. And when technology is made accessible and I can do those things and be given the ability to do stuff, it almost makes my disability irrelevant because I just do it a different way. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's a number one barrier that you can give me as an example for uh, higher education or just education in general? I went to Cal State San Marcos, had a, a great experience there, but yeah, you know, there are definitely lots of, of challenges with technology. I, I did very, very well in school. The hardest part was just working to make things accessible. And, you know, it's great seeing that there's uh, more and more online textbooks and online coursework. And you, you would think, oh, it's good. It's online. It's not uh, on paper. How great that it's more accessible. Mm -hmm. But if I have a online textbook that has is I'm not able to interact with my screen reader on. Uh, it was interesting, like in my first couple semesters, sometimes those interactive simulators mm -hmm. would have zero screen reader support. Oh, yeah. Um, so then I'm taking, you know, way longer trying to magnify my screen. I'm required to get extra help. But then throughout, as the semesters went on, you could slowly see uh, improvements in the accessibility. And then the semester after I left college, someone reached out to me and told me, I was asking me, how, how's your experience with the accessibility of this uh, program? And it was, it was quite poor. But now the Cal State system, um, I believe some of the schools have adopted. If a professor wants to use a certain textbook or simulator, yeah. it has to be accessible for all students. Yeah. You're making me think of something that's quite common, I think, in, in our world, which is we as accessibility professionals or consultants, we want to do good so well that will launch into this way of speaking to either companies or organizations, universities, what have you. And we almost bring this kind of like shame and blame kind of style, like, you know, you don't care. But sometimes I wonder if it's more of they just don't know. You know, you're kind of touching on that, whereas maybe a professor would be like, I'm just, I'm just confused. I don't know anything about this. I've never heard of this issue before. Maybe it's a guest lecturer, right, who doesn't normally speak in a place uh, of higher education. And this is the first time they've had to make a PowerPoint accessible. What are your thoughts on that when I just say, say something like that? How do we approach accessibility from a more, I want to say, holistic point of view or a more empathetic point of view to the people who mm -hmm. are you know, trying to bring it in? I think accessibility needs to continually be seen as a human issue and be humanized because I think you can approach a school and show them all these places on how poor their accessibility is. And it could come ac across as maybe shaming somebody for how bad it is. Mm -hmm. And then if you're just showing data to show all that's wrong, then they could flip and show data and say, this only affects such a small percentage of our students. The other side, like, because it takes a lot of work. Right. Um, yeah. But I think... If you don't look at it as a small percentage of the students, but more humanize it and share the stories of those students mm -hmm. and more so share the challenges that they face, people can better understand the challenges I face versus like the problem at hand with my technology and things I'm trying to access. Yeah. And I think we need to have more so, you know, like applaud people for taking just improving things 1% better because mm -hmm. like 
it's a massive undertaking. Celebrate the, those small changes and just make sure to humanize it and show the challenges that students are facing versus looking at just like the statistics and stuff. You know what? I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit and wonder, do you have an example of that? Like a 1% change maybe to somebody or like in tech or what have you that would be like a really easy fix that to you just made like a world of difference? Personally, for me, having the right technology goes a super long way. A Windows laptop with with JAWS and then switch to now a 16 inch MacBook Pro um, with voiceover. And like that was just very helpful. I think like part of it is coming up with little solutions that make a big difference for me. Mm-hmm. Like when the professor's explaining statistics on the board on his computer, figuring out, all right, let's go on a Google Hangout and share your screen so I could follow along on my computer. And I think just little things like, you know, labeling buttons on student online access portal yeah. thing just actually having screen reader support and making little things to like label buttons and headings, just slight things make something from not really at all screen reader interactive to, okay, I can actually start right, to do right. this. And it makes me do things much faster. You, you heard it here first, folks. We should be prioritizing labels and headings instead of uh, image alt text, okay? You heard it here from Blake first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's lots of ways, right, that we, it just tends to be a big focus on alt text all the time. It's all kind of sometimes we ever talk about or start with, but I'm glad to hear yeah. that. When we talked about this whole show a little bit before, we talked about meeting users halfway and I thought that was a really interesting concept. But what did you meet by meeting users halfway? And I want to kind of take the conversation in that direction. I think it's a really interesting concept and a really important one as well. So did you want to start that off and maybe we can we can talk about that? I feel like in the world of accessibility, um, there can be a lot of pressure where to tell tech companies, all right, you have to make all your products 100% accessible and work with people with disabilities. And it operates on the assumption that all people with disabilities and they all know how to use their technology well, but the reality is that a lot of people in the blind community aren't like super, super good with technology. Like only a smaller percentage of people, one, need to use screen readers, but also just like know how to use screen readers mm-hmm. and use them yeah. well in not knowing different magnification softwares. And they just also just don't know the right tools to be using. And in my situation, like I've, I've tried to work incredibly hard to find the best tools to use. You know, it was always interesting in college when a professor would ask, how long does this assignment take you guys? And for certain ones, people would say one hour. And then times I'd find myself saying, uh, and just in my head, like three hours, four yeah, hours. Right. Because I'm spending all this extra time to make, make this accessible and make it work. Yeah. And I think tech companies need to meet users halfway by making their websites and products work with assistive technologies. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, on the other side, the users need to be like, all right, come on guys. Like we need to learn our assistive technology and tools so that we can actually access these things that are being made accessible. And I think the pandemic really kind of like heightened or brought that issue up too. (laughs) What I think is really interesting when I talk to someone who maybe uh, lost their sight, I'll just use that as an example, at a, at a younger age compared to someone who is gradually gradually losing their sight over time and maybe loses their sight at the age of 60, something like that. And the difference, of course, in technology, let's say aptitude, is going to be is going to be huge, right? Mm-hmm. Even if we're not talking about disabilities, my grandmother does not use Facebook, right? Like, she, yeah. I will not get her on on anything like that. She's definitely not watching. You know, to someone who's younger, maybe they're going to be more apt. They're going to be more comfortable getting on these types of platforms and you know, getting used to technology, anything new that kind of comes your way. So, just the the idea and the understanding, I feel that. Uh, some people who are, who are just younger and comfortable with their tools and technology, they can get through a lot of the issues a lot faster and a lot easier than someone who, you know, suddenly lost their sight or became disabled later in life and, and all of a sudden has to work through the um, the learning process as well as they're kind of, uh, you know, learning the new world too. So that's a really interesting um, conversation to have. You mentioned there quickly about the pandemic. I know we're going to talk about that a lot more too, which is how has the pandemic affected, you know, people with disabilities from your point of view? And I've got a whole bunch of opinions on that too, because I've heard from my community as well, how the pandemic has affected them. But, you know, I'd love to hear from your point of view, how has the pandemic changed the way you work, the way you learn, the way you do things? Yeah, let's let's jump into that. You know, there's so many uh, perspectives on this, um, and I, I hope to bring a, a positive light to the pandemic and how it, or more, more so positive effects that it did have. Because I guess the start of the pandemic was like my last year university and then going into 
starting my career after initial reactions was like for me as someone who's good with using their technology i was like this is awesome mm -hmm, uh, yeah in terms of i don't have to worry about getting to school all sorts of things like now the board is right here on my computer screen rather than up on the wall which i never see and way easier to follow along in class now every assignment is digital it's not like i'm turning in something digitally and others are, are turning in things on paper and then just like a, a neat thing was i have severe central vision loss and i can't see people's faces recognize faces so you know like first week of the pandemic being on zoom like I, i'm like magnifying my screen looking yeah. at all my classmates and um it's just one of those neat little things but like going to college uh as a vision impaired person can be isolating in ways mm -hmm. um if you're not seeing and interacting with people especially for me growing up with perfect vision and being such a an extroverted person you know so many things with the pandemic just allowed things to work better for me but also on the other side like for students with disabilities that weren't good with their technology it was yeah. like one of the worst things that could happen mm -hmm. um, because they were then super forced to have to figure out their assistive technology or they didn't have the in-person support if I could just add to that, like it's it's yeah. obviously that I mean no one's the same, so we can't say a blanket statement that it was beneficial for all users yeah. or, or or students or you know everyone with disabilities, right? I just want to bring out, you know, I've heard that users who have hearing impairment, uh, they they love the fact that Zoom now has uh, captions, right? That's that's benefited a lot of people. They can now have conversations where they don't need to rely on a separate phone or even just re a lip reading. Because it becomes a lot of, you know, a great reduction of barriers uh, to be able to mm -hmm. join a Zoom call and be able to have that. Also, I've heard from people who have anxiety or ADHD, all of a sudden uh, their anxiety levels or their levels of focus have um, have gotten better because they can now work in their own environment, how they choose to have that environment. How else has maybe the pandemic affected, you know, either yourself or other people in the community? Can you think of anything else? Absolutely. In terms of work, the best thing that could happen was like making more remote work opportunities or yeah. just normalizing remote work to where when I was in my last semester of university, I was able to not just be constricted to places close to me, just like a limiting factor. Yeah, um, sure. And then now to be like, okay, I could approach all these remote work opportunities was great. And then in the interview process, there's, you know, I didn't have to worry about like, like share some accommodations I would, I would maybe need, but didn't have to like worry about getting to work. This goes for school and with working. Like I could sit in the comfort of my home office and like have all the tech set up I needed. And um, so that I wouldn't have to go to work and they wouldn't have to like provide things that was like, just made that transition very comfortable. And I think also takes a lot of ease off employers who might have hesitation or just reservations from hiring people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like a great experience to just make that transition and now to normalize it. Approaching other work opportunities like remote work was a thing where I, I, I was first doing a remote sales opportunity and then did a marketing uh, job last year that job was like just two miles away. So mm -hmm. what was really cool is like I could I could work from home or I could go in person. Now you could pick up your work and put it anywhere, which gives greater access to work for everybody, um, but makes the accessibility of it that much yeah. more valuable. And it was cool to see that all these companies just being like, whoa, okay, our world is so much more digital. Like we have to figure out the accessibility and seeing things improve there was like, it was just great to see. Yeah. I knew the stories at the beginning of the pandemic. I had some clients who uh, had a hard time getting on their VPN at the very beginning because everyone all of a sudden had to go on, uh, you know, bring their laptops home and things like that. And it just crashed the VPN and everything. And like, look at that. Look at what the pandemic has done. It's opened up all these kind of new ways of working and things. And I really encourage employers, anyone who's listening, you know, to talk about having those conversations about how can we continue with a blended style of work? I mean, it only really helps out to to everybody, um, you know, to able-bodied uh, employees or yeah, employees with disabilities. I mean, it doesn't matter. This blended style really can help and being open to that conversation as well. Talking about that conversation though, how do we bring up this conversation? I just kind of left this as an open-ended question here. In your opinion, how do we even bring up this conversation around, around disability? Do, do you have any thoughts around that? I know it's quite a, like, that's a big topic in and of itself, but how do you, how do you approach the topic? How do you bring either your disability or having to talk about that? How do you bring that up? Very simply put, I think to have the conversation, you have to bring it up. It's so simply put, 
but I say that because they're talking about disability accommodations in the workplace, being a able-bodied person and wanting to improve the accessibility of your website or product within your company. I think people just need to just start having the conversation mm-hmm. and bring it up yeah. because I think there's a lot of like hesitation or worries about what people could, might say, or we may oversensitize it in ways. Mm-hmm. But I think sometimes when for myself, I, I can you know struggle with being misunderstood for uh, the challenges I face and the things I deal with. I want to feel understood. And the only way I'm going to feel understood, the only way things are going to be made more accessible is if you ask questions. <laughs> and I think asking broad questions to people is like a great way to just get uh, the other person talking. Whether if you're trying to understand a person with a disability, if you're trying to understand a coworker or a manager's thoughts on accessibility, asking broadly just to like start the dialogue versus people can specifically ask things and put yeah. almost like their answer or opinion in the question. But okay, yeah, just kicking off the conversation and asking broadly is is a start to to solutions of on whatever is around disability and accessibility you want to see, but. Yeah, yeah, I really like that idea of, of having broad conversations. And, you know, I think it highlights an employer who is maybe open to having the conversation too. It starts that safe space kind of environment. I know we're talking a lot today about, you know, visual disabilities, but with the invisible disabilities that a lot of people have as well, it is quite challenging to talk about it. I, I know I have someone in the family who has uh, ADHD. It's very difficult for him to talk about it, doesn't really understand how to bring that up sometimes with the employer because it's difficult to have focus and, you know, oh, I won't get too much into it, but having those broad conversations about it, having those open conversations, I think is just so critical to creating that safe space where maybe you'll start to feel like your manager, your employer, your HR department, whatever it is, companies large and small are willing to have that conversation or are open yeah. to have that conversation. Thought of a concrete example, like if you're asking a coworker or, or hiring a person with disability, like rather than saying like, so like, are you able to uh, write up Word documents with your screen reader? Rather than very specifically asking, and that question could sound like they're doubting someone's ability to do that. Just saying like, so how do you, how do you access your work? And then also if it's a conversation on accessibility, rather than approaching a manager and saying, like, why do we have a hundred accessibility errors on our website and they mm-hmm. haven't been fixed? It's like, oh my gosh, like you, you put them in a weird spot versus asking, hey, like what, what are your thoughts on accessibility um, and how we could uh, just a- address that? Absolutely. No, I love that because what you're, what you're giving an example of, I think is an open-ended question, right? We're not asking mm-hmm. something that, you know, forces someone to answer a yes, no, you know, can you write a word document? Can you create a presentation? Cause I think that that creates a bias, right? Doesn't that create a, you know, the expectation in that question is that no, you can't do it. So yeah. you know, I just want to make sure I hear the no before I write or check a box. Right. But then opening right. up the question and saying, how would you do that? Right. Just opening up that, that opportunity and, and to any, you know, managers, business owners, in the call, you know, having that open-ended question saying, being open to whatever the response is too, just really starts that dialogue. And, and I, I, like I said, it opens that safe space. Is that kind of what I'm, what I'm getting? Yeah, you're, you're on it. Okay. Okay, (laughs) Okay. So let's switch gears here. Okay. So we've talked a lot about employment and this is, this is great so far, but I want to hear more about you. I want to hear more about Blake and adapting site. What do you hear for Blake? What is adapting site? I want to hear more about that. I want to hear more about like what the channel's about. Let's jump into that for a second. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a a super exciting thing to be able to start adapting site just as like this media brand to talk about technology and its accessibility for visually impaired people and create content on the YouTube channel to really help teach visually impaired people technology to share the importance of accessibility and also share how I make content creation accessible. Tech companies need to meet users halfway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with the other side of that being, you know, visually impaired people need to understand their technology. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think there's there's a bit of a dilemma there. There's two sides. And uh, I think sometimes we could just look at one side or the other. Most of the times it, it can be forgotten about that the user needs to know their technology and the technology company needs to know the importance of accessibility and how to do it. I think perspective needs to be brought on both sides. And I just want to figure out like, how can I bridge that gap? I've been through a lot of hardships. All the things I've been through and technology is definitely a, a very emotional thing when the amount of challenges I've faced wanting to throw my computer off the roof, um, just dealing with technical difficulties. It's like, yeah. I figured a lot out. So how can I 
shorten somebody else's learning curve. Yeah, I love that. Um, is is just a a great thing to be able to do. And since my vision loss happened, I I, I grew a huge passion for using cameras. Mm -hmm. um, I just you know I I got a GoPro and I'd go places, take a photo, come home, magnify it on my big screen, and be like, whoa, like that's yeah. all that was was there. And um, slowly we're just like, what if I get good at this? And yeah, um, yeah, got better and better at it. Your stuff thing. is so cool. Like I gotta say, your stuff is so good. Like you know, looking at some of the places you go adventuring in, I just think it's like, first off, up here in Canada, it's still a frozen wasteland right now. Okay, it's getting a little bit warmer. But you and I before this, we had conversations about like camping and these cool places. Then I went to check out your channel. Man, you got the, like the most amazing images and videos, like the landscape where, where you are. How do I even describe those uh, the formations? But to you, you told me a really neat story about, you know, why GoPro, like it, the camera gave you sight after sight loss. And you say that very specifically in, in one of your videos. And I think it's just so cool. Cause actually, I think you said it, it's a bit funny that you want to get good at videos, even though, you know, you have vision loss and you kind of say, put it in a way that's like, yeah, I'm going to get good at this. Uh, so why don't you tell me a little bit more about that, the camera was and how it gave you sight after sight loss. You started it. And I just wanted to jump in there and, and talk more about that. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, so I, I got a GoPro and uh, quickly found out that, you know, it was a great camera that kind of indirectly was kind of accessible. First of all, it's incredibly simple to use. Mm -hmm. It's just a couple buttons. It's a super wide angle camera and everything's in focus. So it's just, I just point it in the direction I want it to go and it'll take a good picture or video. Mm -hmm. It also connects to the GoPro app. So I can't use that like tiny little screen on the back of a GoPro. Right. But with magnification and voiceover on my phone, like I could adjust all the settings on there or see the viewfinder bigger on my phone. And so I was quickly like, okay, like I think that I think this could work. Yeah. Uh, what was just like a powerful feeling is like start to take a better photo or make a v cool video and getting like a good response from somebody was like a very cool feeling like for, for mm -hmm. you to say like you thought like the footage looked really cool of the like look landscapes I was at it's a pretty awesome compliment and feeling to be like you know I, I couldn't see that very well at all in person but I could capture yeah sight around me and not only see it better for myself but share that perspective with other people is like is very powerful and I think it's like you know I've I have a condition where there's no cure and I'm totally cool with that it's like this is this is who I am and how I was made but it's like so awesome that you can find technology that can can solve that problem in a unique way it's such a cool feeling to you know capture i say sight because sight is, is just like the visual information that we get around me mm -hmm. and if i could just consume that another way like i'm cool with that and then i've learned so much technically on how to like thrive as a student and um mm -hmm. in internships and work like all sorts of things it's cool when I was like, I, I downloaded Adobe Premiere Pro because I got it for free through school. And I'm like, I know this is super complicated for anybody to figure <laughs> out, but like, I'm just going to do it. Like everything is figure outable with technology. And since then, it's it's been amazing to, you know, now last year having conversations with Adobe and consulting them through research on improving the accessibility of their creative apps. And oh yeah, uh, just, yeah. W just working to like, where I used to think, oh, it's so ironic, like the blind guys in, into taking photos and making videos. But I'm like, no, like if you have problems with mobility, like there's also sorts of tools to get around better, crutches, mm -hmm. wheelchair, like all sorts of things. Like if you can't see well, why wouldn't you use something that could uh, could actually see well? Right. Yeah. You know, I can hear it already. You know, I can hear the arguments in my mind from some client saying something like, well, we make cameras and blind people don't use cameras, so let's not make it accessible, right? Like I can hear the argument in my head and it's an, ex it's an exhaustive argument first off, like it doesn't make any sense. By the way, how does the GoPro app work uh, with voiceover? How's the, how is it? Like, is the, is the accessibility pretty good with it? Yeah, so I'll answer that to address like a bigger point to what your preface there. I also use a Canon. M50 now. That's like my primary mirrorless camera. And I know there's Canon in my network. Okay. So any Canon <laughs> people should be listening up right now. <laughs> so same idea. They have the Canon camera connect app. So same concept to where I have an iPhone with both of the apps. It's like, you know, a lot of time I'm going around with my screen reader, swiping, touching on things. And that will just say button, 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 <laughs> as we're <laughs> familiar with where I'm like, tell me the setting that I'm changing where it's like, you know, you said all the reactions you're thinking of people saying, why should we make cameras accessible? Um, like, right. Wouldn't approach it as like, oh, like make your camera accessible. I'm like, if you started by 
labeling your buttons on this <laughs> app or make, right? making some of these buttons bigger, which would be better for everybody because for some reason they're really small and the design isn't great for anybody. Like you already made something that is making it more accessible. Like some of the stuff, it's like, they're like 90% there where it's not like the next whatever company camera needs to have a full screen reader and magnification on the back screen and have like AI saying what's the viewfinder seeing. It's like, no, right. no, no. Like, like one step at a time, like, like it's okay to grab the low hanging fruit because I'm so close to having things more fully accessible, but I also have to say, I, I was at the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference yeah. yesterday um, and Sony was there and I have to give them a huge shout out there. Sony a7 IV um, is starting to have screen reader support what? for the menu on the back. No way. The hold on, hold on. We got to take a pause there. So the <laughs> Sony a7, what was that, a7 IV? Yeah. Has a screen, like a built-in screen reader in the actual camera itself. Yes. What? So it, it, it's everyone, like, who, everyone who's at CSUN, I got to hear more about this. If you have any information <laughs> on this Sony camera, like I got to hear more about this. So we got yeah. to have a conversation about that. That's so cool. Tell me more about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it, it, it's like very beta, but they're doing it. It's super exciting to see that they're, they're already thinking about it. And I spoke to someone there who is a like vision impaired uh, photographer and videographer that uh, works for Sony. And pretty crazy that this is something that they're, working towards. And I think what's also really cool and allows me to um, like use a mirrorless camera is like the autofocus technology is getting yeah. so good. Yeah. So, and that's the biggest part where it's like, I can kind of frame up a shot. I'm relying on that autofocus all day. Yeah. And Sony has, has incredible autofocus technology, mm -hmm. which is also allowing it to be more accessible and they're going to get the menus to have more screen reader support. And that will evolve ideally into as like you're changing your shutter speed. It's going to say out loud, one, 100, one, That's so cool. one whatever so it is. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was a very powerful perspective to show like that they're working towards it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what a cool competitive edge that you could have showing. Like I just imagine marketing material from Sony highlighting vision impaired photographers. And I think, yeah, you're going to sell people who have any vision problem, but also like, I think a lot of people are going to just seeing like, okay, Sony's doing the right thing. Like yep. that's something I want to be a part of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I used to talk to a lot of photographers in a previous uh, job and it was really, I did tech support for a, uh, for a camera company and I, I would hear these, these issues and they would say like, the, you know, the viewfinder is so small and I can't put my glasses up next to it. So imagine mm -hmm. if you could just have something audibly to change the settings. And I mean, they are probably not legally blind, but you know, the benefits of having it right there is you can change the settings while still having your eye on the viewfinder trying to capture your subject. It would be like yep. so beneficial to once again, everybody. I'm kind of curious, we got five minutes left. I want to know when you're outdoors, like what was your favorite place to, uh, to shoot? Like, where do you go? And like, what's your, what's your favorite place? And maybe why is that? I've been super blessed to have travel a lot and uh, experience a lot of different places. I think one of my favorite places, share a quick story, like is Anza Borrego. It's like the desert, the desert, which is kind of like the inland, like third of San Diego County. Okay, uh, yeah. I, I live in San Diego. There's this like, yeah, just yeah. lots of super cool landscape and lots of uh, landscapes where like you see pictures of it and you go and take a picture there and you're like, man, that was not, <laughs> not that close <laughs> to how it was. Um, and there's this one spot called Slot Canyon. And it's like this very narrow canyon that you walk through, like you can just like shoulder width a part, uh, part of the time. And there's like this cool rock that has fallen and like stopped part way um, above you. Yeah, yeah. And um, like I'd been there like four times and I would always try to take, look out, take a picture of it to try to get the rock and the light coming through. But then it just looks like this muddy overexposed <laughs> image with the light coming in because it's very dark on the bottom light on the top. Yeah. And then like the last time I went, I like, to, I had an ND filter and which basically allowed me to expose the image for the dark part and the bright part yep. um, and get a clean overall image. Um, and then I shot it um, and underexposed a little bit so that I could bring up the exposure more when, and, when editing. And like it came together on photo and in video. And I was just like so proud. Um, just like it was one spot that I went over, over and over and like finally got it. And it's more like a picture I could see online and look at my picture and be like, yeah, yeah my picture's better. It's like, it's just, <laughs> it's just cool, cool to do that. You know? Yeah. 
that was in your video, right? Where you're kind of like shimmying through that, uh, that really narrow kind of, uh, cave, right? Yeah. That was my brother. Yeah. He was like climbing up it a little, so cool. a little bit. Cool yeah. stuff. Ah, man. Like see, yeah. Anyway, we can go on and camping and stuff. I know you're, you go camping a lot. That's kind of where we connected earlier, um, yeah. in prior conversations as well. Well, that's it. I mean, we are almost at time now. So Blake, once again, thanks so much for coming on the show today and yeah. uh, any parting thoughts. It's great to have this conversation and always happy to uh, continue the conversation, whether you check out my YouTube channel, Adapting Site, and comment on those videos or contact me through adaptingsite.com. Um, yeah, I just look forward to having more conversations. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Blake, and have a great day, everyone. Wasn't that a great episode? You probably have lots of new ideas swirling through your head right now. Now, how are you going to go and teach that to your boss, your team, or your clients? You need a strategy to move forward. Contact me today, hi at cambodwine.com, and let's talk about how we can move this forward in your organization or individual practice. If you could right now, like and subscribe to this show, it really does help grow our reach to get more people involved and interested in disability inclusion and making the world a more inclusive place. And don't forget, you can also watch this show live on LinkedIn. Just find me there. It's every Friday at noon Eastern. See you next week.